while you guys are morning people, I'm pleasantly surprised by the level of attention and the enthusiasm here. Nate told me about Creative Mornings two or so years ago, and about, I don't know, six months ago or so, he said, oh, well, this is the lineup for next year, and you know what I think you'd be really good at? How about weird? That, that, that's, that is perfect for you. And I said, great, Nate, yeah, that sounds excellent. So I have a couple things here. I have too many things to hold here as I'm looking at this, but let's see how this goes. Did someone take my scissors? Oh, no, they put them right here. Okay. I might take this off so that I can just demonstrate this first portion here. Most of us, can everybody hear me? Hear me pretty well? Okay, I'll speak up while I'm, I'm doing my little demo here. Most of us are in a bunk. Kind of weird already. <laughs> and it's a squishy, warm space that we typically refine as the comfort zone. And there's everyone's comfort zone right there. And we typically try to avoid a situation like this. Ooh, that wasn't as hot as I thought it was. <laughs> but what if you did it? What if instead you made a proactive practice of being uncomfortable, often, on purpose? I have a story today about my ongoing experience, an experiment, really, about finding uncomfortable experiences to see and test a hypothesis about if I'm more uncomfortable, can I get more comfortable doing bigger and bolder things in the world? And what I've also found is that there's some really good reasons to do this. First, a little hypothesis building here. We've all seen this statement before. It's the statement that the Navy SEALs use. A lot of people use it. I was at a conference a few months ago and someone asked in the audience, oh, what does it take to build Uber to Travis Kalanick, who's the founder of Uber? And he doesn't really say much, but he said, mm, be comfortable being uncomfortable. And if you followed Uber's path so far, you know that this is pretty true. We also know that big things that get accomplished in the world do not come from the comfort bubble that Obama and Angela Merkel and Elon Musk are probably not sitting at home eating bonbons and watching Netflix for weeks on end. And probably many of you here have not had your great burst of creativity and those great moments where you're like, damn, I killed that. When you're like, oh, and I was just so relaxed. It was just, <laughs> sure, let's do it again. So now I'm going to use some stick figures that I drew myself, probably the wrong crowd for that today, uh, to depict the comfort zone you and big bold shit in the world. So this is typically how it looks. Most of us want to be, you know, happy in the comfort zone, that's all good. And my hypothesis is, well, how do you get out of the comfort zone? Can you pop it repeatedly? Can you get better at being comfortable at being uncomfortable? Because then perhaps you'll feel more comfortable doing bigger and bolder things in the world. This is the hypothesis. And I thought, well, if you want to run a marathon, you're going to start running laps. If you want to be a Michelin star chef, you're going to start chopping some onions. And if you want to get comfortable doing big, bold things in the world, well, maybe you should get comfortable doing maybe some smaller stuff for the world because then it can ex perhaps accelerate your path. And this would otherwise seem like a weird experiment, hence the topic for today, but this is about looking into and thinking about if I want to do these big things, and I admire people like an Angela Merkel and Obama, then yeah, I want to be like them. Yeah, how can, I, how can I kind of accelerate this path? Not that you're not doing hard work, not that you're not putting in the hours it takes to do and accomplish big things. This isn't about hacking it and faking it or anything like this. It's about perhaps there's an acceleration here that we can explore. This is how it's going so far <laughs> with these experiences. And a few of them I'll explain. I don't know if you can all see this, so I'll explain. Oh, this picture, you really can't see too much, but I was a day laborer. I did stand-up comedy. I did, I was at a Zen Buddhist retreat that was silent and no eye contact, that was weird. I was, 
you can't see that one, probably good, because it's, it's not appropriate for work, but that's um, when I was a sub with a professional dominatrix. Uh, I did a poem that I performed with a, about an audience about half of my age. This is my, you can't see my pine cone here. This is when I built my own shelter and lived in the woods and had to build this thing from nothing. I've never thought of like raking leaves with my hands going like, oh, that's a good leaf. Oh, that's a good stick. That's, that's weird. And I lived homeless for a night just a few blocks down from here. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. I went to a Scientology orientation. <laughs> That's definitely weird. And I went to a meth support group. I wore a burqa for the day. I was a drag queen. I was a stripper. I panhandled. And I was a nude model. These are a couple of them thus far on this ongoing experiment. Now, I'll tell you one story. Each of them all have their own stories, that's for sure. But with the nude modeling, and this I'll go into kind of the detail here. I thought, oh, this is like Titanic, you know, when Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> you all know, I know you know what I'm talking about. When he's sketching Kate Winslet and it's like super romantic and intimate and exciting, okay. No, no, this is not like that. This is 40 strangers in a Saturday morning workshop class in, on a stage for the model under fluorescent lighting with stage lighting as well. So this is not anything to do with <laughs> intimacy or romantic or anything like that. And so I researched a few groups because I thought, okay, there's gonna be these groups around town that like do these classes or something, right? And sure enough, I start chatting with this one organizer and he says, oh, well, well have, you done, have you done work before? And I'm thinking like, Nude modeling work? I said, no, I just want to show up. This is this thing, I'm doing this experiment. And he goes, oh, da, da. no, well, we have professional models and we pay them, so that, that I don't think that's gonna work. But, you know, I don't organize the models, so why don't you show up, bring a robe to seem professional, and then we can talk maybe at the break, maybe. Okay, so I think like, all right, I'm, I'm like in. I'm gonna like observe this class and see what kind of happens and such. And I get to this class, and it is absolutely packed. People are putting on their smocks, squirting their paint, getting their easels all set up. It is, it is not a casual Saturday morning. That, that is for sure. So I sit in the back, and I'm going, okay, I'm just going to observe. Okay, great. And out walks, I don't know where she came from, but now there's suddenly this woman on stage. Clearly, she has done this before because she just struck a pose, and she was just there. And it's kind of shocking by the way, when you see someone that close, naked, and it's like no big deal. You know, everyone in the room is, you know, right away sketching and doing their thing. I'm going like, oh, oh, hi, anyone, there's a naked woman here. <laughs> Does anyone notice? And it's not like in a strip club or something. I got another story on that. But it, there, I mean, this is broad daylight. That's like as broad, you know, daylight like this. And then you have the fluorescent lights and all that good stuff. So I go, oh, okay, yeah, she's, okay, she's clearly knows what she's doing. And the, they, they time the move, so there's like a five minute and there's a 10 minute pose. It's very strict on the timing. And then there's the break. And I go, okay, yeah, maybe I'll talk to some of these artist people and such. And the organizer comes back up to me. And he's like, oh, uh, Beck, one of the models, they dropped out. They, she's having some car problems. So two minutes, can you be back on stage? We're gonna just go with you. <laughs> now, what is your excuse for saying, I'm not ready to be naked? And I'm trying to think, I'm like, well, wait, I, like what, you shower with your clothes on? No, okay. So I'm laughing to myself in the little bathroom as I'm putting on a rope going like, oh, well, I guess I could say no. I mean, I'm not ready, but who's gonna buy that, okay? And then I'm thinking, oh my God, what if my staff is in there? My staff, a lot of them are right here. Like, what if your staff is there, you know? Do I have any clients in that room? Like, I'm trying to think, I'm like, I looked at all those artists' faces. Like, I look, okay, I don't think I knew anybody. I don't think I knew anybody. Okay, wait a second. Did I shave? Because these are all the things you start thinking about when you are going to be on stage in front of 40 strangers who are going to then paint you. So I go out there, I'm like, I, you know, I'm just laughing to myself thinking there's, there's nothing else I can do here. And I approach the stage and there's a little step stairs, you know, to get on the stage. And I think like, oh my God, this is like approaching the guillotine. Like, I'm just like, you know, just one like, step at a time going up there. And then they go time, because they're timing everything. It's in five, five, and then 10 minute intervals for each pose. 
And I toss off the robe and I just strike a pose because that's pretty much the only option. And no one cares. It's just no one cares. And that's the moment when you realize and you start to slow down and go like, okay, no one cares, it's not a big deal. No one really cares. However, I will say, there is a definite scanning you can feel from the eyes. Like 40 eyeballs are like scanning you, scanning you. Not judging you, that's a little different. And not like in this environment where like, okay, some people aren't paying attention, some people need coffee, you know, whatever. But scanning and, and with meticulous detail looking at you and thinking like, oh, how does that elbow look? And you could watch the faces. So I kind of was looking at some of the faces going like, what are they thinking? And some people are giving you a face like, oh, confused or kind of like, hmm. <laughs> because they can't paint your elbow right or something. I don't, I don't know. So it gets to the last pose, and I'm like, oh, I'm freaking tired. It's, it's hard to, ho to keep a pose that still, I must say. And so I go into child's pose, which if you're not familiar with that, that's, that's this one here. Okay, now some of you are already laughing because you know what I'm about to say, which is, I'm like, this is great. I don't have to look at anybody. No one sees here, no one's got anything here. And then I realized that at least one, <laughs> probably four or five people are now looking directly <laughs> into my asshole. <laughs> and what are you gonna do? <laughs> Pretty much nothing. And no one cared. No one cared. Yeah. And I walked around to see some of the images, you know, because you could, the, the artists are in, in a 360 view. And some people just didn't even paint it. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So art is of the interpretation, as you will. And that was one of the most interesting experiences that I didn't think I would be having on a particular morning. And many of these experience, experiences are like that. So things I've now learned from doing a few of these. First is humility, often to the point of some level of hilarity. And with humility, you need, it, to learn, you need humility. There are several quotes that talk about this, but when you think about it, you cannot learn from someone unless you are humble enough to go like, I don't really know, but you do, and I'm gonna learn from that. And you have to be the student to a survivalist who's been living in Alaska for decades, you know, just for fun, while you're trying to just rake together some pine cones to put your little shack together. Or a drag queen who's been performing since you've been alive. It's interesting to think of, well, who are now my teachers? And a great example of that was when I went to the amateur strip night. And I'll just give this as an example of how you find teachers to be. And I show up for this and I think, okay, there's going to definitely be people in there that they're doing this for a dare, you know, it's on their bucket list, they had five kids or whatever, they never did this, okay, like, I got this, this is not gonna be like, this is not gonna be like the nude model, like, I think I can hang with, with these ladies, okay. Mm. So I show up, and if you, by the way, have not spent some time in a strip club, I highly encourage you to go, because professional strippers are quite athletic and graceful and strong. <laughs> so as I'm watching, I'm like, damn, you know, these ladies, like, they're, they really know how to dance, I guess, you know, hence that some of them introduce themselves as like, oh, I'm a professional strip, uh, pole dancer. They don't even say stripper, necessarily. I go, okay. And at some point in the evening, they say, oh, okay, people who are here for amateur night, you know, show up in the back room, and so we all go into this little tiny room in the back, and you can imagine what the owner of a strip club looks like, a big, burly guy, shaved head, tattoos, he's seen more boobs than anything, so he doesn't give a rat's ass. And he goes, okay, ladies, here's the deal, you gotta have three layers on, you gotta stay in the five bucks minimum, I don't want you touching money, and if you want a job, I'm not talking to you tonight, I will contact you tomorrow if we're interested. And there's about 10 ladies in there, and I go, and I turn to all these ladies, and I say, oh, do you guys know what he's saying? Because what, what? And they're, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a dancer at Pacers on Wednesdays. And I, you know, oh, my club's shut down in the South Bay, so I'm here trying to get a job. And so actually, it's not amateur night. <laughs> it's audition night. And my teachers are now professional strippers who are giving me 
tips and tricks on how to do a great dance in three minutes because it's timed, of course, and this is a competition. Now, I was offered a job, just so you know. <laughs> but I said I had a day job, so. Next thing. Empathy. This is good for a lot of us. And empathy is distinct from sympathy in which you're thinking or you're envisioning oh, how that must feel or something. Empathy is really about you understanding how it's like to be in someone's shoes because you've been there. It's the capacity to understand someone's feelings from within because you've been in the same situation. You probably guys have experienced, you know, your colleagues or something being like, oh, I've been in that position when you were like the bottom of the barrel at the agency or when you were doing your first deck or something like that where you're like, yeah, I totally get where I'm coming from. And that's why mentors can be so good for you because they've been in that space before. And perhaps you've thought, oh, that's too bad when you see someone who's panhandling with that sign in Mission Valley. Or, oh, that's too bad when you see some woman in a burqa and she's just you know, not making eye contact or anything. But when you're holding a sign across from the guy in Mission Valley, and when you're wearing a burqa in the line at Ikea with another woman who's in a burqa, it's not, oh, that's too bad. It's, oh, I get it. Because for a sliver of time, you've been in their shoes. And that's one of the best experiences that you can have in understanding a situation truly. The other interesting thing is that empathy is an antidote to shame. And by that, I'll give you a great illustration from the homeless experience. I live just a few blocks over here, and so one night I thought, okay, I'm gonna do this homeless thing, and I put on some homeless looking attire, I don't know, <laughs> you know, no, just sweatpants and whatever, and I walked a few blocks this way to where there's a lot of the homeless community here in San Diego. And at one point in the evening, and I'm talking with a lot of people, many of whom are totally sane and fine and just have been down on their luck and such. And at one point across the street comes this man and he has khakis on, he has a little polo shirt and he has a little like church, you know, cross symbol, something going on on his shirt. And I go, okay, I don't think this guy's homeless. And he goes, oh, oh, miss, miss, do you, do you, do you want something to eat? Are you okay? We have some soup right, right on the corner. And I was shocked. I was like, oh, oh, yeah, no, I, I'm good, no, I'm, thanks. But my reaction to it was the shock of, oh, I felt for a moment a little ashamed that he thought I was homeless, but no, no, not really. And he is clearly not homeless. But then a few hours later in the evening, I'm standing on a little corner and there's about three or four guys hanging out because there's a lot of hanging out when you're homeless, I will tell you that, time goes slowly. And this one gentleman looked very presentable, clean cut, shaven, clean, but he's chatting with a couple of guys who are still homeless, you can tell, and I'm learning their story. And I said, what's, what's your story? And he said, oh, well, I used to be homeless, and I slept right here. And this guy, Tim, was the first guy who gave me a blanket that first night and said, hey, it's gonna be okay. And despite him now no longer being homeless and looking clearly not homeless, there was no element of anyone having shame here in the situation because he really got it. And that was a powerful example for me to understand that you can gain a lot of empathy experiencing someone's situation, but then also having the shame dissolve from the situation. The last thing is, well, how is this experiment working? Is the hypothesis holding true? If you are practicing being uncomfortable, can you get more comfortable doing bigger and bolder shit in the world? So far, it seems like this is the case. And with more practice, I'm gonna just keep continuing because this is a good practice to keep up. For myself, there's things that I thought, oh, a few years ago, you know, oh, I'm not gonna do so. As an example, I thought, oh, commercial real estate in San Diego, you probably have to be like 50 years old and have like millions of dollars. And now I'm closing my fourth deal here in San Diego. And a couple years ago, I thought, oh, you know, helicopter flying, like that's probably for Navy SEALs and people with engineering backgrounds and aerodynamic degrees and things like that. Well, now I'm flying helicopters and getting my license. So this practice 
continues to just push the edges more and more for me personally. And hence, I will continue with this experiment and practice because of that. Now, hopefully, a few of you in here are feeling maybe a little uncomfortable, thinking, oh, God, what is the last thing I did that was uncomfortable? Even the thought of Nate recommending, hey, talk to someone you don't know. You're like, oh, God, that's not, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it sounds horrible. But I encourage you to do that. And the reason a lot of people in here are having this moment of uncomfortable thinking about this is that because you also don't want to eat bonbons and watch Netflix for weeks on end, maybe one day. But for weeks on end, no. A lot of people here want to do bigger and bolder things that are beyond what their current comfort zone are. And in order to achieve these things, you're going to need to get out of this comfort zone. Here's a little depiction of kind of how that looks for some of you not wanting to do this. <laughs> So in summary, I encourage you to find a cactus. I encourage you to find your comfort zone and get familiar with it and pop it as often as you can. It's just a hot air balloon anyway, so you might as well get used to it. And with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Mm -hmm.